Hi everybody, welcome to the Winnipeg Humane Society webinar series. I'm Nancy from the Behavior Department and today we're going to talk about taking care of our cats and dogs. So what kind of physical needs they have and what we need to do for them. Um, if you're thinking about adopting a cat or a dog, these might be some things to think about or even if you have a cat or dog, this might give you some new tips. Um, so let's think about what do our animals need from us to live a healthy life. They need water, they need food, they need health care, and they need grooming all to some extent. So we're going to talk about these topics and we're going to start off with the most important thing for all mammal species and that's water. So fresh water must always be available to our animals um, so they can make sure to keep their own hydration up, especially cats um, who don't always drink a lot of water. Um, they don't need a lot of water, but um, um, it should always be available for when they do want it. Uh, water that just sits in a bowl can become stale pretty quickly. And so if you find your pets not drinking out of the water that you're putting out for them, you might want to change it more frequently. Um, so we also want to think about too, what kind of bowl do we drink out of? Some pets have a preference. Some animals don't like drinking out of metal bowls because the uh, water will take on uh, a metally taste. So you might think about a glass bowl or a plastic bowl in that case. Um, some pets only want to drink out of your sink or your toilet, right? Kind of gross sometimes people think. Um, but if you think of it from the pet's point of view, that water is really fresh and it's typically quite cold. So if your pet does have a habit of wanting to do that, you might want to think about how you're giving them their water. And you could come up with some other ideas, say you got to change it more, change the type of bowl, change the water more often. Or you can think about a pet fountain. They're becoming uh, very popular. Um, they're especially great for cats, but dogs love them too. And you can get different sizes. And here's a picture of a cat drinking from one very common type you'll see around. And um, it just keeps the, f the water moving and they have filters in them too, so that the um, water will taste better for them and be, be fresher. So um, these are a, a great idea if, um, if you're concerned about how much your pet is drinking. So. So food, food is a huge topic, and this is going to depend so much on your particular animal, um, what type of diet they need, what kind of diet. You'll definitely want to talk to your vet, it, you, you're, see if your pet has any kind of special needs with allergies or, um, you know, there can be so many different um, issues that animals can have that can be helped by a proper diet. So if your animal is having health problems, definitely see your vet and talk to them about what kind of food might be best for your pet. If they don't have any, um, any particular health issues, you, can, you have a huge choice of, of foods out there. You can, uh, of dry foods or kibble, canned or wet food. Uh, some people like to feed raw or actually cook their own diet so, uh, for their pet, so it just depends. And different factors you might want to consider can be um, things such as uh, your budget, um, and the availability of the food. You might pick the most amazing diet for your pet, but if it, if it can only be picked up at one pet store that isn't convenient for you to get to, um, that might not be the best choice for you. So, so I can say there's a huge variety of foods out there and it will depend a lot on your, your animal, your budget, uh, where you might buy the food and that sort of thing. So um, a good place to start is to talk to your, talk to your vet. Okay, so now we have our food, so where are we gonna put it? Uh, generally speaking, it's the best idea is to feed your pets in a quiet area away from activity. Maybe not in the kitchen uh, during mealtimes and everybody's coming and going. Um, it'll help uh, cats will eat more calmly. Um, they can be really subjected to stress and that can affect what they eat and how they eat. And um, for dogs, it might make them think that they're going to have to guard their food and we don't want that. So we want to keep it all, keep it in a quieter space generally. And we also want to keep our cat food out of reach of our dogs. Um, this might mean you're feeding your cat somewhere elevated or in another room. Um, cat food isn't bad for dogs. Dogs love cat food. Cat food is very high in protein and uh, very tasty and more expensive than dog food. So dogs might love it. So we want to make sure that the cat is, uh, gets their portion and plus that the um, dog isn't filling up on really uh, on a lot of calories from uh, from cat food. So uh, you also want to think about how much to feed. This is going to vary hugely too. Uh, if you're feeding a commercial diet, it, there's going to be recommended amounts. That may 
change uh, be very different depending on your dog. Your, your dog may eat a lot less that's on the, on the bag and still be in a, a very good weight. Um, so say it just, just depends on your animal. So, and you want to think too, does your animal like to graze? So are you going to leave your uh, food out during the day or are they going to have to eat in very set meal times? Um, this is particularly a thing with cats. Some cats like to just nibble on bits throughout the day. And that's okay, that's kind of a natural way for them to eat. Dogs are more likely to want to have a big meal and eat all at once, but some dogs graze too. So just, so just things to think about that if you are gonna leave food out during the day, where are you gonna leave it? You can leave it, make sure it's somewhere where they can eat uh, in peace. So. And a couple things that just, uh, just for cats, litter boxes, super important for cats' health. Uh, number one, it's a way to monitor their health because you'll be able to see how their, uh, how their urine's doing and if, and, and how often they're uh, they're going poop and how that looks and that sort of thing. So um, it's very important to keep a clean litter box so you can monitor that day to day. And you also want to think of where you're going to put them. Cats, uh, if they're um, scared out of a litter box, can become really averse to using it, and that's when they start going in our laundry pile and that sort of thing. We don't want that. Um, so we want to make sure they're in a, a nice, quiet space where they can feel safe. And we want to think about how many we have. If uh, we have a, a big house with lots of lots of floors and uh, we have lots of cats, we wanna make sure that we have enough litter boxes in enough spaces for them. Uh, usually the line is that you wanna have one more litter box than you have cats. So if you have two cats, three litter boxes in different spaces is, is ideal. So cats also require scratching surfaces. Uh, this isn't just a want, this is a need. Um, they, it's a very, uh, uh, important behavior for cats to be able to scratch, to scratch things. It stretches their muscles. It actually sheds off the uh, the loose bits on their claws. It's uh, they mark their territory with their scent, which helps them feel more secure. And it's a stress reduction activity. So you want to give your cat something appropriate to scratch on. If your cat is scratching something you don't want them to, get a scratching post and put it. If it's a corner of the couch, get a scratching post, put it right beside the corner of the couch to block it so the cat will now have somewhere appropriate to scratch. If cats have enough places and enough surfaces they like to scratch, they won't scratch your furniture. So um, that is the key there. Some cats like flat surfaces, like you can buy cardboard scratchers that lay flat on the ground. So you just have to try different things that your cat will prefer. And uh, just know that though it's very important for cats to have somewhere appropriate to scratch. And they also, cats also need a uh, space of their own. Um, if a cat doesn't have somewhere they can retreat to, if they're feeling stressed out, it can very quickly affect their uh, behavior, it can affect their health. And uh, so it's super important that they have a calm place to go. And think vertically in your house. Humans tend to think horizontally because we live, you know, walking around on the floors. Uh, cats like high spaces. So on, you can make them their own little bed on top of furniture that they can get to, you know, a bookcase or a dresser or that sort of thing. So if we think about places we can get to them, not just cat posts, so a cat trees are awesome so for sure cat trees but you can also think of more creative spaces especially if you don't have a lot of space and uh, think think up high what you can do put up shelving and that sort of thing so um, but cats definitely need a space of their own okay so now we're going to move on to healthcare and grooming and there's a lot of overlap in this because grooming can very quickly become a healthcare issue so um, we're going to talk about uh, how do your how your pets going to be able to get healthcare and grooming as stress-free as possible and um, so that's we're gonna have to teach them how to be handled and this is um, really important if you get a pet young get a kitten or a puppy you definitely want to work on this right from the very beginning um, some animals are just more sensitive to being touched all over the body and so well, there's things we can do but we they're gonna need to be handled and handled by strangers a lot of time when they go to places like the vet's office or if you're gonna be taking them to a groomer, or even at home, if uh, you're gonna to wanna to brush their coats, you may have to give them medication at some point. Um, most animals need help with their nails and getting their nails clipped, so um, it's very good for animals to get used to being handled. <clears throat> so the importance of doing this as uh, stress-free as possible, you wanna use uh, force-free handling on them. The reason we wanna do that, uh, if we're not forcing them, into situations, it'll reduce stress on the pet. That'll make us less stressed out. Uh, it improves our relationship with our pets. Um, we're not giving them reason not to trust us. And it can actually lower the risk of illness or injury. When you, 
cats are, uh, like you said before, are very prone to stress and that stress-related health problems. One of them very common are uh, cats that are stressed out can develop urinary tract infections and that can lead to all kinds of problems with the litter box. It can actually be life-threatening um, sometimes. So, you know, we want to keep, keep things stress-free as possible for them. Um, if your dog is needs to be handled and is very stressed out if they say the groomers they can get cut because they're being wiggly and not not um, going along with what's going on we don't want them getting cut and um and a panicked animal can be a danger to the humans you know they can scratch or bite us in an attempt to defend themselves to get away because they feel really threatened by the handling so so we definitely want to handle them with um fear and force free handling for sure so if i'm going to be going to a vet or groomers, how do I find somebody that I think would uh, would understand this? Well, talk to them. First of all, you can always interview a groomer or a vet before you go in and um, ask them if they have plans, if they have procedures to reduce stress. You know, does the vet's office have a separate space for cats to wait versus dogs? Um, are people trained in uh, force-free methods? There's actually a fear-free certification that uh, vet clinics and vet techs and vets can have. And um, so look for the logo on their things or ask if anybody has taken the fear-free course. Um, all these things mean just mean that they're paying attention to um, and they're conscious of the fact that there are things you can do to help make an animal's visit less stressful. So pets very often don't like having body parts touch, some, some parts more than others, um, but we can help them get used to it. So we're going to talk about that. The most common spots for animals to give us a hard time are their paws and their nails, uh, in their mouth, uh, touching their tail, going in their ears, or touching their bellies. So uh, these are all things we want to, uh, places we want to get them used to being touched. And being touched will help make healthcare less stressful, which is good for you and good for them. So it's good for everybody. So the more you can do ahead of time, the better. And this doesn't have to take a long time or be a, a big deal, but we can do it um, very, if we do it in a structured way, it can help a lot. So to train your pet to be used to being touched in a way such as like, uh, let's say like when they go to the vet or the groomer, first of all, um, while you're doing this kind of training, never hold them when they, if they start getting wiggly, um, that's the time to end the session. You never want to pin them down or hold them tight when you're training. You know, if your animal is injured or sick and they have to go to the vet, um, they may have to, to, to treat them. But while we're training them, we're going to um, never uh, pin them down or hold them tight. What you're going to do, uh, we use the paws as an example. You know, it makes sense that animals don't want their paws, they feel a little defensive about their paws because uh, I think if they're wild animals, uh, something hurting their paws could, could uh, uh, end their life, right? They, could, uh, they wouldn't be able to run and catch, catch uh, food and that's it. So they're a little bit defensive about them, so super common. So we start off with your dog or your cat is laying relaxed. You can try just, just touching their paw and then give them a treat. That's it. And this kind of stuff is great. You can do it while you're just relaxing on the couch with them at night. Just have a little treat, uh, some treats with you. And then, uh, you know, reach over, pet their paw a little bit. So when your dog starts, their cat starts to realize that when you touch their paw like that, that means a treat's coming and they start looking at you for the treat. Then you can start, you know, petting their paw a little more firmly or giving a little quick little squeeze and, uh, and repeat. And then you can just keep doing that. And you just get, as your animal gets used to you touching, you can be a little more firm in your touching and hold it a little bit more like, um, like if you're doing paws, you can hold them a little bit more like you might be cutting their nails, but you don't cut their nails. You know, you just do that and then they're fine with it. So this can make them feel relaxed. So when you come towards them and you go to pick up a paw for a nail, they're all used to that part. So it's, it's not a big deal. They aren't going, whoa, what are you doing? So, and you can do that for each body part. So if your dog is laying and snuggling with you, you can lift their ear flap and have a look in their ear, give them a treat. Same thing, you know, and um, touching their tail, touching their belly. Um, sometimes we give our dogs belly rubs, like to roll over and that sort of thing. But if you think about how their belly might be touched, as they had a vet visit, where they might have to have, you know, the hand underneath squeezing, to try, try and feel their insides and that sort of thing. So um, try and touch them a little more, a little more firmly and, uh, and just slowly get them used to it. And and have that uh, paired with, with good things. So for cats and small dogs, they're gonna wanna visit uh, the vet, cats for sure, in a carrier. Uh, a lot of small dogs like carriers too. So we can teach them to like the carrier ahead of time. 
which will be one less thing for them to worry about when they go to the vet. Um, so one way to do that is get them, get them used to it just being a normal part of their life. Just leave it out in a space where they see it regularly. Um, you can toss treats inside and have them getting used to going in and getting treats. Don't close the door. Never force them in. Um, and, uh, and yeah, just get them used to it. It's the carrier is just part of, part of their life. So at the appointment time, you want them to go in with as little fuss as possible. So you don't want to rush. You don't want to be stressed. Like, oh my gosh, we have to be there in 10 minutes. So just get in there. Um, so first you can try and lure them in with treats. If they won't go with a lure, um, then you just need to scoop them up and put them in. A little tip for cats is if you pick your cat up and you hold their paws and put them in back in first, it'll always go smoothly. Um, we can uh, say if you ever have any questions about this sort of thing, you can always call the, the uh, our behavior helpline and I'll give that number at the end of the webinar. So for dogs, you can get them to practice ahead of time by take them on uh, on visits, have a practice visit. So if you've uh, talked to a groomer and you're going to be making an appointment with them, you can always take your dog in quickly. Just go in for a visit, go into the reception area, say hi to the site, hi to everybody there, uh, give your dog a few treats, and then that's it. That's, that's the visit. So they learn that this is a familiar place and it's not a big deal when you're going to come and leave them there for their grooming session. So, And you can do the same with your vet office. You can always go and sit in the reception area for a bit and give them a couple treats and then and maybe uh, the, most vet's office have a scale in the uh, reception room and you maybe give your dog a weight and get them on the scale, get them used to that, and then off you go. And that's it. Just short, fun little little visits, uh, bring treats, and and most groomers and veterinarians will uh, will welcome these kind of things because they benefit from uh, an animal that's used to that's relaxed and, and used to their area too. So, so grooming, grooming we would is what we basically call uh, taking care of their fur and their skin and their nails. So uh, our animals might need a little bit of help with this, more or less depending. Uh, on their coat. So there's so many different types of coats on cats and dogs. Um, you know, long, medium, short, curly, wavy, wired, smooth, smooth, coarse, you know, silky, rough, non-shedding, shedding a lot, you know, single coats, double coats, hairless coats. Even they need, uh, even hairless animals need uh, help taking care of their skin. So, so we want to think about our pet and what kind of coat they have and how much help they may need with it. Say a, a domestic short hair cat uh, might just need a little bit of brush once in a while when they're shedding, but cats are pretty good at taking care of their own coats. Uh, but then if you have a uh, a medium haired or a long haired cat, sometimes they get knots behind their ears no matter what they do, so they still need our help. So, so we just got to think about our pet. And so what are the benefits of helping them groom? Uh, removes dead hair and dirt, which makes them look better and makes them feel better. It reduces matting, and matting in coats are knots that form in their coats can actually become a health issue um, if it gets too severe all over their body. So we want to reduce the matting. Uh, grooming reduces shedding in the home, which is really important to a lot of people. Um, it can actually be fun time with your with your pet once they get to uh, get to know that it's a fun thing because you've trained them that all this touching means good things, you know. And a lot of a lot of cats and dogs love being brushed for for start. So. Um, you know, and plus, of course, grooming, it helps them look cute. So, always a bonus. So we'll start with a bit of uh, home grooming tips. Well, we'll start with the don'ts. Um, if you have a dog with a, a coat that grows and needs regular grooming and their hair starts getting long around their eyes, um, please don't try to trim around your dog's face unless this, you know, you are a practice groomer. Scissors around your dog's eyes can be really dangerous. Um, and so we, we don't want to do that. If their hair is getting long, use a hair tie or a clip and keep the fur out of their eyes until their next grooming appointment. Um, the other tip I got from our, uh, our groomer at the Humane Society was, um, if you're going to brush, brush, when you're brushing your dog's coat, to make sure that you brush right to the base of the hair. Um, it's easy to brush on top of their coat. And so you got the brush, you just brush, 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 but that can leave mats developing underneath if you don't get right to the bottom. And then, so your dog may look all fuzzy and, and, and smooth on top, and then, but underneath they're getting painful knots. So when you're brushing out a dog that, that's coat, whose coat will mat, you wanna separate the coat into sections and brush or comb right from the root of the hairs all, all the way along. 
So, so they, they don't have those sneaky mats because they can be painful and they can actually cause uh, injury to their skin if they get really bad. So for home bathing our pets, um, cats generally don't need baths unless something happens <laughs> unusually to them, but they do not habitually need, need baths. Um, some, some dogs benefit from baths, but if you are going to bathe your dog at home, don't do it more than every two weeks. Um, always use a appropriate shampoo. Human shampoos are uh, too strong and will be harsh on their skin, so you don't want to use those. Um, you also don't want to do it too frequently. It can dry out their skin, damage their hair follicles, and it strips off the important oils that actually makes their coats kind of work for them. You know, an, an animal's coat protects them from the elements, and so we don't want to be always stripping off um, all the natural oils. So um, you don't want to do it uh, maybe every three months would be ideal, um, but definitely no more than every two weeks for sure. If your dog gets muddy frequently, if you have a really active dog that likes to get out there and likes to run through puddles and all that sort of thing, um, rinse them with plain water and towel them dry. They do not need shampoo all the time. Um, if their coats get easily tangled and your dog gets wet a lot, make sure that you brush or comb them out when they've been wet because mat, uh, mats can actually tighten up when they get wet. And like I said, those can be painful and a health problem. So. So when it comes to nail trimming, um, very important for dogs. Um, there are people who say that their dog's nails wear down enough just from walking on cement. Uh, I have never had one of those dogs. Um, so it does happen, but a lot of dogs need help from us to trim their nails. Um, if their nails get too long, it actually pushes back on the bones of their feet and um, can cause discomfort and make it affect how they walk, which can cause all kinds of joint problems. And it can be a real health, health issue. So you definitely wanna keep them always uh, trimmed nicely. Um, when they start tick, tick, ticking on the floor too much, you definitely wanna give them a trim. Um, you wanna cut off small bits at a time. So if you do it more frequently, it's better to do it more frequently cutting off small bits than to waiting till they get longer. The, uh, the quick of the nail, which is the, the pink part that you can see in white uh, nails on animals, um, is where the, uh, there's a blood vessel and a lot of nerve endings. And if you let their nails get longer, the quick actually gets longer. So you can't cut them shorter without hurting the dog. So, um, so you definitely wanna cut back the small bits. Uh, this can be a lot easier in white nails. Dogs with black nails can be a little tricky. So you, uh, you wanna be careful in cutting back so that you don't cut their quicks. So uh, you can also, some dogs are finding very stressful the handling of their paws. So you, you can even just do a few nails at a time and then come back at another time and do a few more nails. That'll keep it less stressful. Your dog won't be running from the nail clippers as quickly if they're used to their paws being touched and they know it's not gonna be a really long stressful session. So. So for cats, um, you know, they're usually pretty good at taking care of their nails. They, uh, that's one of the reasons they scratch and that sort of thing, but indoor cats' nails can get, get quite long. And if they do get too long, they can get caught in soft surfaces when they don't mean to. So if your cat goes to jump off a cat tree, their nails can get caught and they can actually really injure themselves like the point of ripping the nail out, which can cause a real problem in their foot. So, um, so you wanna always trim back the, the sharp pointy needly part and avoiding the pink quick. Cat's nails are fairly easy. The, the hard part with cats is getting them calm and letting them handle your paw, handle their paws. Um, the cutting part is, is fairly, fairly clear once you have a good look at their nail. And uh, so yet again, you only want to do a few at a time uh, to keep it less stressful. Uh, some cats really don't like being held uh, for this sort of thing. So it can be helpful to catch them when they're just kind of sleepy and just do a nail or two and then come back say, and do uh, do more later. It's always better to to wait and come back than to make it all stressful and then start pinning them down and just trying to get those last couple done. It's a, always better to come back later. So those are the main things. Um, we want to talk about kept keeping our animals uh, healthy in our homes. So just to do a quick, uh, quick go back over it, make sure your animal always has access to fresh water. Um, feed them an appropriate diet for your pet, which could be any of a huge variety of commercially available and home done diets. So um, say talk to your vet and, uh, and find out what works for your animal. Uh, for cats, we wanna keep their litter boxes clean, keep them accessible so that they're always available. That could be a health issue for cats. 
Um, before you have to go to the vet or the, the groomers, that sort of thing, we want to train your pet to accept handling. Um, we never want to force handling on them while we're at home and we're doing the training. Um, the more that the less force we use, the more they'll accept it and it'll become better and better and better over time. So, um, so we want to keep our pets coats as mat free as possible all the time. You know, they can quickly develop little ones behind their ears, uh, some long haired cats and lots of dogs. Um, so we want to keep up on those. They're also on their, their, um, on their back end, they get a lot of mats and under their, their, uh, their front, front legs and their little leg pits there. They can, um, so we want to watch out for those, those spots in particular, but try to keep them as mat free as possible. Um, if your dog's eye, uh, fur near his eyes is getting a little bit long, you probably want to keep the scissors away from there so that we don't have any risk of cutting them. If your dog's facial hair is getting too long, just use clips to hold it back or a hair tie until uh, it's time for the next grooming session. And any kind of uh, home care you're doing with your pet, whether it's grooming or nail trimming or that sort of thing, or training them to enjoy being touched all over, keep the sessions short, even just, just a few minutes every time. We'll keep their stress low and make them better the next time you have to go to the vet or the groomers. So it'll all benefit in the end. So if uh, anybody has any more questions about uh, this kind of thing or pet behavior, they can call our Winnipeg Humane Society helpline at 204-988-8808. Or you can email us at behavior, if you notice that's behavior with a U, at winnipeghumanesociety.ca. Or you can check out our website, which has quite a few tips under your pets at winnipeghumanesociety.ca. Okay, well, thanks for tuning in, and I hope this was helpful.